So welcome everybody to the weekly Bootstrap seminar. And we are happy to have today Sasha Shivoyedo from CERN telling us probing gravitational effective field theories with the four graviton amplitude. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Leonardo, very much for the invitation. It's always great to see all the friends around. And uh, I will be talking about this uh, recent paper with uh, uh, Tsvi and uh, Dimitrius. And uh, as clear from the title, we'll be interested in gravity. And uh, maybe some, I start by some of you are interested, there will be a workshop in uh, GGI this April and May uh, dedicated to gravity waves with a broad program with the, maybe with uh, people who actually uh, do some re things related to experiments and, and all the intermediate uh, steps. So if some of you are interested, please take a look. And uh, for this talk, uh, we will be interested in four-dimensional gravity. So, um, uh, of course, we, 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 we all uh, know that it's an effective field theory. And so we, we would like to, to understand the uh, uh, correction to the Einstein theory. And uh, uh, remarkably, systematic bounds can be placed on uh, possible corrections to the uh, Einstein gravity, and uh, uh, as we as we know that this uh, these corrections are high derivative corrections, and uh, we expect this uh, to be coming uh, to be generated by integrating out massive degrees of freedom. Uh, and in fact, in gravity, even uh, because even the leading term is irrelevant, we we expect that G Newton itself uh, can be, uh, in some senses, generated by by the UV. Um, now, this is, of course, an old story trying to in flat space, trying to bound these coefficients and to derive some bounds. Uh, however, in the uh, last maybe six months, there was some uh, exciting developments, and uh, uh, some of them are uh, listed here. So these are the, the papers which will be relevant uh, for, for my work. Uh, for this for this talk, in fact, uh, um, in some sense, our talk. So all these papers, um, most of them uh, were focused on the scattering of scalar particles. In this paper by uh, Nima and Yutin and Suchi, and there was some discussion of gravitons, and so we will uh, develop on that. But uh, in a sense, the the idea and apparatus which we will be using is is here. And so for some of you, probably most of you have been following, uh, but uh, the, the basic uh, new ingredient, uh, uh, well, it's, it's an old idea of dispersion relation, but with a slightly new twists. And uh, one, one new twist, which will be relevant for my talk is that uh, when you combine uh, causality, unitarity, well, and crossing, and uh, just oh, again, as usual, all this, all these papers focus on two to two scattering, so. What you get is a two-sided bounce. And uh, so here is some cartoon. And uh, this is not completely, I mean, this is not always the case. For example, in this paper, some couplings are discussed uh, in a scalar scattering where the, the yes, and the, the region is bounded. So the bounds are from above and from below on the axis. And this is important for my talk, just to set the stage from the start. I will be always talking about the couplings of the same dimensionality. So say uh, G1 over G0 and G2 over G0, this is a number. There is just a set of numbers. And this set of numbers uh, is bounded from above and from below. Um, and uh, this is a somewhat new ingredient. One another important aspect is that I will be always interested in a perturbative regime. So like, like uh, in, in, in nature, uh, gravity is weakly coupled. And so it was a beautiful, paper by Andrea, Joao, and Pedro, which is, uh, analyzes this in a non-perturbative fashion. Uh, here, I will be talking about, uh, in some sense, perturbative analysis. We, we, we just care, this is a small number, and these corrections are even more tiny, so we just care for, for, for this. Uh, for my talk, we would just want to understand something about these first few corrections. And um, uh, as I said that, uh, say, uh, uh, this two-sided bounds, uh, it is not always the case, but in fact, for gravity, 
this is always the case. So there, there was some analysis here for scalar theories and there was some cone, but for gravity, you just have two-sided bounds. And uh, uh, well, in my talk first, in our paper, we first wanted to derive this bounds for gravitons in four dimensions to understand what are these regions. This is, so this is the usual bootstrap game, which you're all very much familiar with. And uh, something which is slightly unusual for the, for the bootstrap is that we will also play some primal problem game. And the primal problem game would be that we will try to fill, fill in these regions with some uh, solutions to the, to the set of uh, constraints that we want to impose. And, uh, but also it will not be the primal problem that, was, uh, uh, that is usually played at the level of the 2 2 scattering, but we want to fill it with what I call physical, physical theories. So what do I mean by a physical theory? Um, Can I ask a question first? Please, please. Is, is there a general understanding of which, uh, uh, given an effective field theory, which couplings we should expect to be have to obey two solid bounds and which couplings we should expect to just be bounded from below, say? Uh, well, here, um, I think for the for the irrelevant couplings for which we can write uh, dispersion relations and for this kind of ratios, we expect uh, two-sided bounds. So whenever we have uh, um, so uh, these couplings which I mentioned here, which was not bounded from two sides, it was because you have gravity and you have QFT and you can add them up and you can see the ratio of QFT to gravity and this ratio is not fixed. But uh, the couplings, uh, which uh, um, otherwise, I think, uh, uh, at least, for, okay, this is general question. Let me just say that for gravity, everything is decided bounds. It's uh, we can discuss later maybe which ones are not decided bounds. Okay, thanks. But Sasha, isn't it true that uh, often when you say two sided bounds, one side is different from the other? One side is really a bound, and the other is more like a separation between weak and strong coupling. Isn't this fair? Uh, that often this two-sided bound, one is really a bound and the other, if you violate it, it just means you are not at weak coupling. Okay, so here, all these guys- Or no. For me, they're all small. They're all proportional to G Newton with the same power. So this is really a, a number of order one for me. So, um, yeah, I would say this are really two-sided bounds, and we will, you will see it. These are really just some numbers of order one. So the two-sided bounds. But maybe as I go on, you will you will point out uh, what you have in mind, and and we can clarify that. Because okay, um, yeah. Now, um, so here I said I will play the game for physical theories. So what what do I mean? By physical theory, let me define. So by physical theory, I mean that whatever machine you have at your disposal that generates for you a perturbatively consistent S matrix for any number of particles. Uh, not just two to two, but M to N. And of course, uh, you know, this is a very, uh, this is a, when we do the bootstrap uh, analysis, this is far beyond the reach of, uh, what we can do, but uh, there are there are devices like Lagrangians or Walsh theory which do this for us. And so, the two examples of physical theories which I consider in in this talk is a, one is a string theory, which is a machine. There's a theory which, especially if we work perturbatively in G Newton, it generates for me the S matrix for all these amplitudes, and we we expect it to be consistent. And the second example is quantum field theory minimally coupled to GR. And uh, this is another example, which we will consider in, in, in this talk. Uh, uh, well, there is a word uh, minimally because uh, uh, if, if you couple at least some weakly coupled uh, quantum field theories, not minimally to, to, to gravity, there, there is a many papers which, which show that if you couple it non minimally, you run into trouble. No. We can try to discuss if there is some wiggling room, but let me just couple them minimally. Now, uh, of course, since uh, these theories are so powerful that they solve all the constraints, uh, we can now use the theory to solve the primal problem 
to at least partially to feel this, to answer this question to, to, of course, to the best of our uh, ability, we cannot answer this in full generality and ask then, okay, how much of this region we can feel? So this is a question we, we essentially asked in our paper. And uh, since the number of uh, constraints is potentially much more, you might think that, okay, could it be that you occupy a much smaller region? And in fact, uh, that's what we find. So uh, we will consider the examples, which, which I will describe. We will use this example to generate scattering amplitudes. I will describe exactly what is the set of scattering amplitudes. And we will find that the set of regions that we can generate in this way um, uh, is much smaller than this bounds that come from two to two scattering uh, come. Now, at this point, of course, you can ask many, many questions, like which QFTs we can ask. Is it a lamp post? Is it not? Um, there are all these great questions. Uh, most of them I, I will not be able to, to answer, but the minimal way you can think about it, if, if one day bootstrappers will be so powerful that they solve this problem, uh, they will not be able to do better than what I did today. So this is, uh, so this is at least this. Um, and then we might hope that uh, how strong are these constraints. Second comment, uh, this is of course in the spirit of uh, string, string, landscape versus swamp land game. Uh, however, the, the, these usual discussions are usually much more ambitious and they work non-perturbatively in G-Newton. Here I'm fine, you know, if you, if you have an S matrix which makes sense perturbatively, for my game, it's okay. I, I, then it's a separate question. When we do it non-perturbatively, probably we'll do still much better than uh, we discussed in this talk. Uh, but this is beyond our capacity, of course. So there are two parts. Um, First is a standard, uh, our standard game. We start from principles and derive bounds. I will describe this for the gravitons. Second, uh, we will generate data. And I told you that uh, one piece of data that we can generate is a QFT coupled to gravity. And uh, you, know, you might be surprised, but even if you take the simplest possible QFT, like a free scalar, and you go to the powerful uh, amplitude people uh, like Tzvi and you ask them, is it available as the computer? And uh, it was very surprising to me to learn in 2019 that it hasn't been computing. So in fact, in, in this class, until as far as I know, until our work in the literature, there are no examples. So this was completely unexplored. And uh, it would be very interesting to understand what we can, can we say about can say about this as matrices. So the first part of my paper, which I will not cover today much, is to generate this EFT data. We consider uh, this kind of minimally coupled quantum field, three quantum field theories coupled to gravity. So this is will be either free scalar, free fermion, spin one, spin three half, and spin two, for the usual reasons that if you want to uh, cross spin two barrier, you, you run into trouble. Um, and, uh, and then we will use this data to um, play this risky game of trying to understand, uh, well, I told you it's, it occupies much smaller region. So is there some uh, principle at play? Uh, can we explain, uh, um, can we explain what, what are the small regions? And uh, I will introduce one parameter in, in, my, uh, in, in my talk, which will control, which will be allow me to, by playing with this parameter to understand the location of these small regions. And then uh, maybe, maybe it will be useful in the future to think about this parameter since it nicely captures uh, this, um, uh, this feature. So these were general things. Let me just jump into the, into the meat of the, of the talk and then we will continue from there. So let's consider the, the typical uh, typical game. Uh, we take some Wilson coefficients. So this is a small energy expansion of the amplitude, uh, say, um, um, you know, A41 multiply uh, S cube T. So four is the dimension and, t and the second index is the number of powers of T. So since you see that it's four, four, this is dimensionless. Four, four, this is dimensionless. And coming back to the question of Pedro in, in terms of G Newton, this has the same order, so it's really a number. So the kind of uh, the game, uh, the game uh, people played, I guess, before 2020 was the green, the green set of constraints. When you do not use crossing, you get set, set some set of bounds, and you use dispersion relations. 
Uh, then this update from uh, from the last year is that you use crossing and you get this uh, red region. Now uh, we try to fill this region with uh, theories uh, and you get this black line here. So if you zoom in, uh, you see that um, you see you see several things here. So first of all, you see this set of dots. So a set of dots corresponds to different theories and uh, scale, fermion vector, super string, heterotic string and bosonic string, I am allow you. And uh, since we are working in uh, perturbatively in G-Newton, you can add amplitudes. So when, when people solve this 2 to 2 scattering and solve unitarity, causality and crossing, if you have amplitude A1 and you have amplitude A2 and you add them as non-negative coefficients, it satisfies everything. So it's a cone. And therefore, if you have two points, you can connect them with a line. Secondly, you can change the number of species. You can take 10 scalars, 100 scalars. You can change different masses of scalars. You can take infinitely many spin two particles with various masses. The claim is that no matter what you do, uh, you end in these islands. And this is one simplifying thing about taking the couplings on the same dimensionality is that adding this different masses or different number of species is trivial. I will come back to that. So, um, it is, you might be quite surprised because I mean, the theories we're considering are very different of different nature. This is a string theory. So it is a, in a sense, uh, it's a, uh, has higher spin particles at three level uh, of all spins, radio trajectories. These are some simpler theories, but as you see that they land in the same region. So you might think that in some sense they're similar to each other. So you might ask, okay, what is it? And if you look at two functions, one is a gamma function, second is the logarithms. So in, in, in which metric or how, how do we think about it? What is special about this region? Sorry, Sasha, I have an elementary confusion. Perhaps yeah. you're coming to it. Yeah. So if I look at uh, perturbative string theory, the regex growth is a little better than S square because yeah. of, of the regularization of the graviton. Right, right. But what is the regex growth for this mean, if I just have a minimal couple yeah. scalar or fermi, yeah, it's precisely s squared or yeah, it will be a three level graviton propagator gives me s squared. That's right, that's right. Uh, note that, uh, that so the regular trajectories, of course, are very different. You do not have uh, you just have a three level gr here, so you will just get precisely s square for this theory. But here I'm looking at the couplings which which are far enough that you don't care about that. You know, if you would like me then to, to ah, so you're saying that for this particular couplings, you don't the subtract. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it's yeah. okay to subtract away the the graviton yes. the graviton uh, propagate. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. I will come back maybe at some point if time permits to this uh, type of summer rules that you guys studied, but very briefly, don't have much to say about that. So now uh, uh, I told you that there is a one way to, you can ask, okay, well, it looks quite dramatic. There are this big region and there is this tiny region. So why, why is that? And uh, as, as I will uh, try to explain that, in fact, all the theories, they, they, share, uh, they share a certain structure in the, in the, stru in, in, in the uh, partial waves, or in, if you wish, in the spectral densities, how they, how they uh, structured. And uh, uh, you can parameterize this, uh, this structure in, in many, it's a lot of structure, of course, uh, but for simplicity in our paper, we just introduce one parameter, which essentially characterizes uh, how higher spin partial waves in each channel are suppressed compared to low spin partial wave. And this is what is called low spin dominance. And I will explain again in detail. And the, the idea would be that if you, if you take your bounds and you introduce, and if you wish, an extra assumptions that there is an hierarchy between partial waves with this parameter. Obviously, you made an extra assumption. You, you should derive a stronger bounds. That's clear. So the, 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 the content here is that this simple assumptions that I will make will, will land us exactly on this, on this line, or on this region, depending on the number of parameters. So on the value of this, of this suppression and uh, we can discuss this and uh, of course so this is what uh, again yeah this is what uh, um, uh, might be something sorry i'm a little confused by your figure what is this dashed 
yeah. there's a line yes. of physical theory and then there's a dashed region this what one? is the, yeah what is that about yes so this is uh, the uh, as i said uh, you make a, we will make an extra assumption that uh, that say the the spectral density at lo lowest spin let's say when the channel where there is j equals 0 average of all masses is larger or equal than parameter alpha than rho j larger than zero. Let's say you make this assumption. So you have some parameter alpha. So now, uh, so here, this parameter alpha is set to, uh, to 100. In fact, all these examples essentially of this type. And uh, they have much more structure. And so as soon as, as I will explain, as soon as you make this assumption and then you, you take, uh, uh, you can take this assumption and nicely combine it with the techniques people use. In particular, you can combine this assumption with null constraints to derive rigorous bounds. Just re rigorous in a sense that it follows from crossing in this. And this dashed line is what follows from this extra assumption. And uh, so the size of that depends on alpha. Exactly. When you send alpha, if you see there is a real, little tiny, uh, this orange or red uh, line which goes through, through all these points. Uh, here, if you see here, this is alpha equals to infinity. And of course, in, in the physical theories, alpha is not equal to infinity, but we can we can discuss wh why it happens. Um, so this would be the plan I will describe. Uh, so this is one. This is my, will be the main part of my talk. I, I will try to make few other comments here. I uh, about in elasticity and about three-point coupling of graviton, but uh, are there any questions about this? The, the uh, basic, can I ask a question? Line? Please. Um, you, you, you mentioned in order to add amplitudes and get something consistent, you mentioned it was important that you work perturbatively. Why, why is that? Well, because uh, the, 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 there is, a, there is if, you, if you remember, the unitarity is something like this, whatever, minus one or some, some. And so when we work perturbatively, we only care about this part. So you never worry about that in one. If you work, but if you, were to add, if you were to add with some convex coefficient, like one and one minus X, it wouldn't like to the S matrix instead of the amplitude, wouldn't it work? Uh... Well, you have, to, you have to be careful because you have here FJ square, right? So okay. I, I, I'm not sure. Maybe, maybe it's a, it's a, I think that, that it's just, I, I was just referring to the naive fact that if you add, they do not form a cone in a sense, you cannot add them as arbitrarily positive coefficient. Right. There's, now, there's if okay. you add them with one and minus one, I suspect that, uh, I mean, it will be maybe fine here, but now you have quadratic dependence here. So maybe it's still okay. Okay. Thank you. I will not use, I will, I will never use it in my, I will never use this, this in my talk, this, this part. So. Any other questions? Okay, let me proceed. So the setup, uh, we, we are doing a graviton scattering. So it's particularly simple in, in four dimensions. We have uh, three different uh, holistic configurations. Uh, MHV double minus, single minus, all plus. There is a, the dependence on polarization is trivial. Uh, all the data is in these functions of model stub invariance. So they're called FG and H. I will be mostly talking about this um, double minus amplitude. It's an elastic amplitude. Uh, this is written in all incoming notation. So physically, it's plus plus graviton going to plus plus graviton. So it's elastic, and you expect positivity. These are inelastic processes, and so you have to work a little bit harder to constrain them. Now, crossing is uh, simple. It's just for this amplitude, you have this, and G and H are fully crossing symmetric. So this is the fact. Then you have uh, uh, so-called Hermi Hermitian elasticity because it generalizes the corresponding property in, in flat space for, for, the, for the scalars and, and essentially just says that it will, uh, well, it is written here, but it will allow me to take this continuity of the amplitude and still use optical theorem. So this uh, amplitude in the lower cut will be related to the conjugate amplitude. 
And um, um, finally, there is parity. Uh, if you want to think in quantum gravity, of course, you don't expect this to be symmetry, but okay, it doesn't matter. We can we can use it or not. It does. So you see that if you use crossing and you use uh, and and you use uh, this Hermitian ellipticity, effectively you can write rewrite all other helicities in terms of these three three guys and taking complex conjugation. Now unitarity is again something uh, simple, and there was this. Uh, uh, a long work on spinning uh, spinning as matrix bootstrap and uh, which will very thoroughly work this out here we, I will be much will be much simpler for me so for dimensions you take the discontinuity let's say in t channel uh, and uh, what will tell you tell, tell me that each of these functions f g and h it's it's is some set of partial waves and set of spectral densities so this spectral density is into, is uh, essentially a product of Couplings. If you exchange some state, some representation doesn't doesn't have to be one particle state. Uh, so this uh, this is what unitarity tells us, and, and perturbation uh, perturbatively that's that's what we get. Um, with for various components, you have various spectral densities. Some of them are positive definite for elastic processes. So this is this these two spectral densities for various channels others for inelastic processes they're not positive definite by the but they're bounded by cauchy schwartz inequality which is simply says that you make you take a coupling plus plus going to something plus minus going to something and this is bounded by square of uh, so this th this is unitarity for me for my talk it's uh, this set of conditions this is simple now uh coming back to um uh, important question, I guess, in discussion, what, what uh, Leonardo was asking. Regio limit. Um, okay, at tree level, there is, a, uh, there is this condition, which we, I guess, believe and are comfortable with, because it has a simple interpretation in terms of causality and the propagation of signals. Um, now, for my talk, I, I will be thinking, uh, this is a bound which we effectively will be using. So my amplitudes will not be allowed to grow faster than T cube. And you can understand this T cube by, uh, by the fact that um, you know, if you have an amplitude and you take uh, with some regi intercept G naught. So you, if you, you now exchange two regions and the, the, the maximum or two, the maximum uh, spin is of the region is two then uh, the, the way they add up is t to the 2j naught minus one and since j naught is bounded by two then you get three that's how you can understand it so in particular for the for example if you have a spin two loop massive spin two you will you will saturate this bound if you have a scalar here then it will grow much much slower but for me it all doesn't matter so much i will simply use the dispersion relations which work for this um, and you can think about uh, whatever amplitude you have. If it satisfies this, we can play the game uh, that I'm playing. And one loop amplitudes I will be using playing the game. Finally, people uh, discuss this uh, quantum bound, and I think it would be great to have some progress on deriving it and understand if it's actually true or not. I guess because we don't really, uh, at the moment, have good argument for that. Sorry, can I ask a question here? So yeah. usually I think of applying the dispersion relation to the amplitude, not to some piece of the amplitude. Yeah. So why, why not just like, why not just use the quantum one? Can you apply okay, it? So, uh, yes, so the immediate problem with quantum one is that I'm working in D equals four. So it's higher divergent. So that's, you know, this problem that we don't know what is a non-perturbative object in D equals four that we study. Okay, it's maybe some dressed uh, so it's important for you to drop the pole in order, like when you write M one loop, you yeah. you, really, you mean you've oh, dropped okay. the pole in the tree level term? No, or? no, no, no. It's 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 uh, here. You can keep the your full quantum amplitude, for example. It does, doesn't matter. I'm just saying that uh, this is what uh, this is what I expect for one loop amplitude. Now this is what I will be using because I'm working, uh, but. You can work with fully quantum amplitude. And uh, for example, if you think of the amplitudes as being high dimensional gravitational amplitudes where external kinematics was uh, you know, restricted to, uh, 
the four dimensions, then it's fine. You can use the bound you want. But I guess the point is that you will do you'll do, you'll do a subtraction, a special relation that effectively kills the, the three-level graviton propagation. Uh, is, that, is that not the case? Well, in, in fact, uh, uh, no, I will not be doing any subtraction. You will see it on next slides. This is a bit uh, uh, the miracle of gravity, I guess. That um, um, and the 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 graviton tree level is is there. There is, but it doesn't affect anything because, well, you, you let me let me just continue. Uh, but one technical point, say for me, I'm working with a piece of the amplitude because I'm working to leading order G Newton, and this allows me to, to drop all this discussion about IR divergences and uh, you know, all the problems. So I'm just. I'm just analyzing the functions in this class where I imagine that I care about the leading correction to GR due to massive degrees of freedom. And for this, for this question, IR divergences are not important. Now, if you want to play the game where you bound G Newton in terms of something, then yes, we need to understand the full quantum amplitude. Then we, we have to understand IR divergences in 4D, for example, or work in D larger than four or work in ADS. But... Now, um, let me write down low energy expansion. So, uh, so this let me take this double minus amplitude or MHV amplitude. Uh, so you see that for me, uh, it will have this this form, uh, gr, r cube, corrections. Uh, so note that uh, I guess one fact which might not be familiar is that if you, uh, you re remember the three point amplitudes are completely fixed, there is a gr term, there is r cube term. And in fact, R cube term contributes to the MHV amplitude, the R cube square. So this would be uh, useful for us. And if you have a massless scalar, it contributes like that. And for the rest, we assume we have a power like uh, power uh, simple Taylor expansion, for example. And uh, this in particular, uh, this is not true for graviton loops. So I'm, I'm not talking about graviton loops here. And uh, similarly, you can write for single minus and all plus amplitudes and uh, Okay, this is a standard of low energy expansion that I will be also using. Uh, now dispersion relation and subtractions. In fact, even, even with this weaker bound uh, that I wrote. Uh, <coughs> Sasha, I have a question. Uh, please, please. Yeah, I, I got a bit confused at this point because you, so you, you said that all this setup is supposed to uh, capture corrections to gravity from some massive matter. Yeah. And then you gave us these examples where you basically considered all possible massive matter you could think of. Yeah. So is there anything else that this setup can capture? You know, what <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'll be talking about, you know, what, what do you have in mind? What kind of other theories you have in mind that were not captured by your, uh, well, something, you know, can you give uh, us some, like, yeah, can you give me some? No, I, I don't know, but I'm thinking of something that something that we are not aware of. So, well, if it's no, because case, because because it's like it's like a class of theories which have to be perturbative, but they do not have yes. to be anything else that you already considered. Well, are there such yes. things? Maybe maybe there aren't such things. Yeah. Uh, maybe. Is Please, there any string, reason to think that such things exist? Sorry, perturbative string theory, right? I mean, uh, yeah, perturbative string theory is, is is in this class, right? Yeah. So, yeah, it's. Uh, I guess my understanding Slav was asking if perturbative string theory, QFT coupled to GR, what is the third thing? Well, maybe we can have some Kaluza Klein models with extra dimensions, but I think they're also in this class. Maybe okay. some uh, brain scenarios or maybe some uh, you know, phenomenologist will invent something. Uh, so okay. I don't know. I, I don't know anything uh, uh, concrete, but I'm just being, being agnostic here. But for example, you use some principles to limit your <coughs> your examples to minimally coupled theories. Yes. So now, so, is there yeah. any? Maybe it's premature, but uh, are those principles now you're relaxing them essentially, right? But for example, suppose that you relax those principles in those examples, would you get some bigger region? I, well, if you relax, for example, yes, if you relax, let's say we consider a scalar minimally coupled to GR and we now make it non-minimally, non-minimally yeah. coupled. Now we know that this theory is not consistent if you start scattering scalar as external state. 
this is what I was having in mind because then you'll get this Shapiro time advance. So that's why I, we did not consider it. But if you just, do, if you don't care about that, uh, you can add this non-minimal couplings and they somehow should modify our analysis. But I don't know how exactly bigger the region you will get. But on the other hand, you know that the theory is not consistent from the beginning. So it's, I'm not sure what is that. If it's very interesting. Just to make sure that theory would satisfy, for example, these these uh, constraints that you are going to impose on the gravity and gravity and scattering, the non minimally coupled scale. Yes, yes, it will, it will, uh, it will satisfy. It will satisfy. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so that uh, answers my question. Okay. Thanks. Um, yes. One interesting theory, which I would like to know where it is, is uh, say large MQCD coupled to gravity, for example, which is not in the class of what we consider because we don't know how to compute the gravitational amplitude in a large MQCD coupled to gravity, which is the same is related closely to the fact that we don't know how to compute uh, correlation function of stress tensors in, in large MQCD. But again, I would expect it will live in the same region for the reason I will explain. So. Now, uh, yes, uh, in fact that uh, even, even if you take a one loop, one loop scale or one loop spin to uh, amplitude, which decays where the, the, the whole M grows like T cube, so even faster than a tree level, for this function F that I, I care about, which is this function of uh, Mandelstam invariant, you can write this person relation without subtractions. And this is a close, this is a also another aspect of why we want to scatter gravitons. This is related to the fact that gravitons have spin two and you have this uh, helicity, helicity polarization, trivial helicity factor. Okay, maybe that's not a good idea to go back, but effectively the fact that you have this guy here, it's, it behaves like S to the four or T to the fourth. So if your amplitude M, for example, bounded like T cube, it means that F cannot, it, it should decay in fact as one over T and we will write this Persian relation for F. So this is a, this great thing that happens in gravity. You get, you gain extra powers of, of T essentially and you can write this Persian relation. Uh, of course, if you have some extra strong Reggie bound, you can, you can write more dispersion relations. It doesn't go away, but it, it's kind of trying to add anti-subtractions. If you start adding powers of T in the numerator. This is a different story, but for the F, I, I will just write this dispersion relation. Here you see that you get this. Well, you, you, you can express F as a, some integral through over the UV. You have uh, some spectral densities, partial waves, and, and then the three point couplings and, and, and GR. That's just standard thing. And uh, we defined uh, our low energy ex here, low energy expansion. Uh, well, yeah, that's a, that's a pity. But this 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 coefficients f. Sorry for that. Uh, this is essentially the linearly related to this akj, which is a term in the amplitude. Uh, when the amplitude has a term akj, it's simply s k minus j t to the j. And uh, we have this uh, familiar by now formulas where you have spectral densities. These are non-negative because this is elastic amplitude f. And some uh, some polynomials of of J. And uh, dynamical information is in this spectral densities, and in fact, in this averages, you take spectral density, you average uh, over mass with some power which is controlled by the dimension k of the coupling, and then the information about the theory is here. Now uh, the data. Uh, let me comment briefly on the data. Well, as, as you know, this one is a tree level string theory and there was a, the many works recently by the Indian group on analyzing tree level graviton scattering. And the basic point I want to make or remind you is that tree level amplitudes of graviton has, <clears throat> they have a great degree of universality in string theory because they, if the compactification at least is not warped, if it's a, a direct product of Minkowski times some internal manifold, then uh, these amplitudes do not depend on the internal manifold. Uh, so this is uh, all, all we all we have: super string, heterotic string, and bosonic string. And bosonic string, you also have this inelastic amplitudes for gravitons. For heterotic and, and super string, you just have MHV amplitude. 
these are familiar formulas. Now, uh, the, the new thing that we, we have in the paper is uh, the data for the field theory. And here it's, it's a bag of tricks from the modern amplitudes techniques. You, you start with, a, I guess, classic result that one loop amplitudes is a, you can write it in the basis, now boxes, triangles, uh, and uh, bubbles, some rational terms. You use generalized unitarity by matching to the three level amplitudes on the cuts. Uh, then at least in our paper, this is uh, com this three level amplitude is computed using double copy, start starting from the gauge theory and going uh, to gravity. And then you glue these things together. You, you get an object which has right discontinuities and you have to fix the rational terms. And these rational terms uh, were fixed in our paper by imposing the right structure of UV divergence as they have to be local. Or alternatively, you, you can get them by uh, having the right radial limit. And, and one thing is that technically, if you care, this, this one loop amplitude, they, they are quite special because uh, the dependence on this internal mass uh, is quite simple in, in the Feynman diagrams. And, uh, and so you, some nice things happen. And uh, I already said that we consider minimally coupled matter to get, uh, to get the causal scattering of the matter on gravity. Well, we use some supersymmetric decomposition for technical reasons. And then uh, in, in the end, you get some paper. This is an analog of what I showed you for gamma functions, but now for the say one loop scalar box, you have your uh, MHV amplitude. This function F is the sum of some basic blocks. And here, the only piece of information is that it has this uh, form, um, it has boxes with litus, logs, some rational terms. Um, this structure, in fact, in, is quite remarkable if you, if you pay attention because here there is no dependent on mass. So all the dependence on mass is inside this basis integrals repackaged. And this is a little bit of magic. But in any case, we have the precise formulas you can take and use them and expand them at large M. And we have the expansion in the paper if you want to play some bounds game with the sample use. Well, sorry, Sasha, why is that an epsilon still? You're... Uh, this is, uh, you can set epsilon to zero if you want to go for D. So the, because the way it was done is that there are various intermediate steps, they can be divergent and then the divergences cancel in the sum. So we have also, uh, we, we, we work first in dimensional regularization in particular, it also allows us to easily then uh, generalize results from 4D to any D matter in the loop. Uh, but for 4D, you just set epsilon to zero in these formulas. Uh, there, this, this little object, some of them will be divergent, but these divergences cancel and you get the final result. And for example, here you see there is no, no epsilon and everything can be rewritten in terms of this, in terms of these blocks. Yeah. Thanks. So we have the EFT data. So let's go to the bounds. And uh, yeah, this is something I already told, but let me say in more, in more detail. So. We, we can talk about the theory island, which is simply the stack, the fact that perturbatively we can add amplitudes with positive coefficients and all the constraints I discussed are still satisfied. So it's a convex cone. And, and uh, for my talk, the theory island is built like this. I'm allowing myself to add string amplitudes and this loop amplitudes where you choose your spectrum at, at will, any number of particles you want uh, with any masses. This is a, the island we consider in the paper. It would be, of course, great to extend it, but the, the, I think it would be hard to go beyond that because in a sense, this is a set of solvable examples. Um, and uh, for example, if you want to generalize here, we have to consider strongly coupled QFT, get QFT coupled to gravity, and this seems to be far beyond the reach. So it seems like this is pretty much what we can do at the moment. And uh, yes, we focus on the couplings of the same dimensionality. And the reason is that, uh, you know, let's say you have uh, two theories. Uh, I consider N1 scalars with, one, when, with mass N1. And uh, I, I look at some irrelevant coupling with some M1 to the 10, say, uh, S4T. And uh, you consider a different theory with N2 scalars of mass N2 uh, times, again, to the 10. You get some correction to the amplitude like this. You see that when we talk about if we if I will consider the couplings of same dimensionality as 4t, uh, s cubed t square, they all receive just a simple overall coefficient which depends on the mass. We can just you know, put it outside of the bracket, 
And the only effect will be that a priori, if you have 10 scalars, then this coefficient C has to be integer. But the effect of having particles of different mass is that you allow yourself now to take these coefficients to be just positive or non-negative. Non uh, so this is a technical uh, simplification and also we will be able to derive bounds analytically. Of course, it would be great to understand all that and full generality, consider all couplings of all dimensions and see uh, what this landscape uh, allow you to feel in, in the whole complete set of couplings. But for simplicity in our paper, just for the cleanness, we, we, we did this and for some, so it, this is the one thing which would be nice to generalize. Um, the derivation of the bound, the way we used it was a method from the, this paper by uh, Nima, Yutina and Su Chen which uh, let me just say two words about that. You, uh, you write, you choose your set of couplings, which is dimensionless. Using dispersion relations, you write them as a sum of certain vectors. Uh, vectors are given by a structure of partial waves. This is a non-negative because spectral density is a non-negative. Now you want to know, okay, well, you want to bound the region where this couplings, set of couplings live. And uh, well, the convenient way to characterize this space, which is a polygon, is by characterizing its faces. And the faces uh, are characterized by normals to them. And uh, you want your vector to be on the right side of this, say, face, for example. And this is encoded by this condition that you, you take the product of f times w. And this has to be non-negative. So the task for you, if I give you some this set of couplings, the task is then to find all the faces, which at first looks like a formidable task because the space is dimension, uh, this dimensionality of the space is infinite. But first, uh, well, one is an infinite number of, because uh, you can have, uh, you have a energy variable, which is that the energy of the intermediate state. But when we talk about couplings of same dimensionality, it sort of factors out. And second, the second infinity is a spin and for this uh, second infinity, there is this observation, which is non-rigorous. And it's another thing which would be great to explore and make rigorous is that uh, if you take just one channel, so if you, if you drop this guy, for example, you find that the, the polygon is what is called cyclic. And for me, it simply means that you can write down immediately all the set of boundaries. And this set of boundaries, of course, to, to build a phase to build a plane, you just uh, take a determinant of this basis vectors. And then the cyclicity tells you that you just right away identify the set of uh, the, the relevant determinants, which comes from this consecutive pairs. And this is uh, for the one channel, this has been proven in this paper using the special property of the partial waves. Um, for two channels, you lose this property. There is no cyclicity, cyclicity anymore. However, there is a structure which, okay, let me call it here almost cyclic. This is empirical, which, which is a, the statement is that effectively you just get uh, faces from this channel, faces from this channel, and then you get a few extra faces. But these are all only involve low spin. So you just uh, can uh, explicitly analyze all the possible, uh, all the possible determinants of low spin and you identify this non-cyclic non boundaries. And that's how we, in practice, we found uh, all the uh, boundaries. Uh, this is not rigorous because it involves, effectively, it, 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 include, it involves cutting this sum with some J max and then extrapolating to J max to infinity. But I guess this is standard. So in any case, this is how we did it. And in this way, you can derive bounds analytically. We can explicitly, for the couplings we, we, we care, we just can write down explicitly all the, all the boundaries. Um, example, let me take, say, k equals 2, so dimensionality 2. So you have three couplings at this level, a to 0, a to 1, a to 2. This is a set of boundaries. This has its determinants. So this has a cyclic determinants, where these are consecutive partial waves. Um, and this is the outlier. This is a special phase, but you see it in only involve lowest spin in, in one channel and almost in the next to lowest spin in the other channel. And this pattern we observe to continue, uh, but we do not have a, a deep or an, any understanding of 
why is this happening? So here we take a very practical approach. We just simply wanted to understand the, the, the bounds. And, and now, you, for, say for these couplings, you can check that there is Are a cross. You, I, this is a naive question because I haven't yeah, yeah. mastered the courage to read this very long paper yet. But yeah. uh, how is this technically different from the approach of uh, Simon and uh, all the other approach by Tolly? I mean, is, is it yes. different? So, or is it the same? Uh, Okay, I think uh, at, at the level of uh, at the level of the couplings of same dimensionality, in then it must be the same because here the game you are playing, you first solve the larger problem. So here, this is a, imagine an amplitude which does not have crossing symmetry. So this is uh, the the problem. That's a solution to this problem, and then you 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 take a slice of this larger problem by by imposing crossing. Uh, I guess technically the, the way it's done is slightly different in the sense that here we really use cyclicity and we analytically analyze the, the uh, we can write down the solution to this larger problems and impose this null constraint, which is a slice of the region. But I think for the couplings of the same dimensionality, it must be the same. I mean, we are, we are just solving the same problem. Right. So, but here it's just done in using this structure of- uh, But you have a hunch that this is more efficient Perhaps. Well, here is the, the 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 at least for this problem of interest here, you can it's beautiful. It can be solved analytically. So you can just really explicitly see all the all the boundaries, and and then you 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 take a crossing slice. You you have a figure, and then you you see that imposing crossing has taken a slice of this higher dimensional uh, problem, and. Uh, for for this for the for this lowest set of couplings that we, we we consider this is this was pretty simple and efficient. You can really easily do this. At, uh, I don't know. I haven't tried to do it in the other way by Tolle and uh, et al. and Simone et al. So, but but Sasha, is it clear that this is the the optimal set of constraints that it's? At... Well, it's uh, yeah. So here the optimality depends on what what do you mean by. Uh, optimal so there is there is a let's say you you consider the complete set of constraints of various dimensions so like uh, complete eft hedron so to say then uh, i don't know if it affects this bounds or not for the couplings of same dimensionality this uh, i believe this is complete just because there is no other faces now I think it's it's a, it's an excellent question if you include these other couplings of different dimensionality and you impose constraint between them do they propagate to this subset of couplings unfortunately I I, I don't understand so I, I, I'm not sure what's the answer to this question so I think there is a, in principle I have we have not at this point from everything I told you I haven't shown that uh, somehow if you um, consider a complete problem, you will not be able to improve this bounds. So, but yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah. Okay. So it would be good to check. So maybe, uh, for example, for the uh, using these methods so that uh, Leonardo et al. were using, with, uh, where you can efficiently uh, play these games uh, in a complete generality, it's just one can take one example and, and see. If one can improve these bounds by extending the space, um, yeah. But, but in conformal bootstrap, it would be definitely the case that you would, like, if you would improve, if you would analyze, impose just crossing on on the derivatives of order three with respect to z z bar, and then with respect to five, and just derive some constraints. Yeah. Yeah, I think it wouldn't give you the best possible bounds. Okay, here you have different dimensionalities and, and cutoff will enter the game somehow, I understand. But, yeah, uh, it, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's an important question to understand that. Um, okay, so if you do this, that's, that's what you get. Some numbers. Now uh, let's me plot this uh, this region and the plot the set of theories. Uh, here the vertical axis does not mean much. I'm just 
listing different points so that you can see them uh, in, in extra dimension. But uh, the basic thing you see is that the set of couplings and physical theories lie in this smaller region. So can we understand uh, why, why is that? And uh, the, the way we the way we can we, we did it in our paper is that we we now use this this null constraints which uh, were studied in these papers first. And the way the way you do that is that um, as I showed you before, this all these couplings admits this dispersive representation as a sum over all spins. Um, from minimal to infinity. And uh, let me just for convenience to get rid of this higher spin tails, take crossing symmetric, uh, crossing symmetry constraint and add to the dispersive representation a zero. So here I, I choose a zero in a particular way. And I choose a zero in such a way that the dispersive representation of each of these couplings, say for example, let's take A to two, it will take the form six average of row two plus plus. And so here again, this uh, um, two means the power with which you average of energies plus plus means the channel. Then you will find that if you choose, if you add this zero with a judiciously chosen coefficient that you get say uh, minimal spin, spin, spin two partial wave, spin four partial wave and, and the rest comes with a minus sign. So they are all uh, non-positive. Uh, and therefore, then you can bound the coupling by dropping all these terms, which are manifestly non-positive, and you get this uh, this rigorous bound. So at this point, this rigorous bound, it uh, there is nothing special about this bound. It was just for for my convenience I, I derived it, because now you kind of see uh, the 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 bound only in terms of small spin partial waves. So we can limit our discussion to the structure of the small spin partial waves. And we try to understand what kind of, but okay, this bound is rigorous uh, and it will be a little bit more intuitive because we can now think of the structure of low spin partial waves and, and see how can we saturate the bound. And the basic observation is this, you see, for example, here the allowed region is from say minus eight, whatever to the six. How do you get to the six? Well, you see, to get to the six, you need to take this row two plus plus, and if you make it very large, then the right hand side essentially is dominated by row two plus plus, and you get six. Uh, similarly, on the other side, if you get this minus eight, if you take this row row five plus minus, and you make it dominant, so you drop these guys, you get essentially this is minus eight. Yeah. However, this the special thing that in 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 each a corresponding channel, this is not the lowest spin partial wave. So this is row two plus plus, here you have row zero plus plus. This is row five plus minus, and here you have row four plus minus. And uh, the physical theories uh, are not like that. In fact, the physical theories, they satisfy exactly what we call this, uh, this low spin dominance, where you take the lowest spin partial wave, and it is, uh, larger as, as you increase spin these partial waves they rapidly decrease in fact in, in, in the examples and so let me introduce this one parameter it's a very convenient parameter where uh, i'm just saying that the lowest spin average of all energies is larger equals than alpha times any other higher spin and uh, in fact in the all examples of uh, of the physical theories this parameter alpha is the relevant is around 100. Um, and, uh, and then you see that to get to the six, it's exactly the opposite of what happens. How you, to get to the six, you want row two to be much larger than row zero. But in practice, you, you always dominate it by um, the slowest spin. And now if you add this assumption and you combine it with this rigorous bound, you can get a stronger constraint. And now since we, we, we here we derive the constraints in terms of very few low spins. It's very simple to implement this. It's just a linear algebra. And, and then you see that, say if you set alpha equal to 100, you get this, you get this region which lands around the physical theories. So that's, that's a basic story. And uh, if you plot the spectral densities in the examples that 
uh, we looked, you see that even though the functions look very different, the either string amplitudes or loop amplitudes, in fact, the structure of partial waste is very similar. Here are this, uh, this spectral densities as a function of spin. This scale is logarithmic, so they drop very rapidly here. And uh, you have some structure, but in any case, the lowest spin partial wave in every channel always dominant. And uh, this is why all the amplitudes land on the same land in the same place. So this is, the if you wish, this number and the fact that it's similar in string amplitudes and the loop amplitudes is what actually makes them similar and, and what make, at least for the problem we consider of these couplings, land them at the same place. Um, now you can repeat the story. This is I already showed you at the beginning of the talk. Um, you can go to k equals six. It's again the same story. You have this big region and then all the amplitudes land in the smaller region. And again, this low spin dominance gives it for you. And if you send this parameter to infinity, you end this line around which the theory cluster. So that's um, that's a story. Um, and uh, just a curious comment, I'm over time, so I have to wrap up. Uh, one, th that in this way, you can ask, okay, are all coefficients in the effective field theory expansion of order one? So let's say you are a naive effective field theorist and you write your amplitude expansion like this and you, you arrange your terms like uh, say C0, here is something completely crossing symmetric. And then here is a C1 and uh, C rest, they have only TU crossing symmetry and they uh, uh, we chose them according to the regular limit. So it seems like a natural thing to, to write, but okay, it's a basis. If you, if you write this basis in terms of this uh, coefficients A I was talking about, you'll discover that in fact, this coefficient C rest is proportional to this difference A for two minus three halves A for one, which is precisely this straight line on these plots. So you expect it to be, since the, 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 the points lie very close to the straight line, this coefficient will be very small. And in fact, if you take this theories, uh, scalar vector fermion, if you take this ratio, say take a scalar theory, you find that this ratio is tiny. So it's a kind of hierarchy between the coefficients it can be 10 to the minus two, uh, but without any symmetry. So you might have confused why is it so small? And the fact that the fact that it's so small has explanation that this coupling happens not to receive the, the contribution into its uh, dispersive representation from the lowest spin. And the amplitudes have this uh, simple structure where they drop the, the spectral density of drop of the function of spin. Now I have a comment about three-point coupling, uh, but I don't. Have right, but why is that? Is that unitarity? Yeah. I mean, uh, it's a uh, it's unitarity because I use dispersive uh, representation and. Uh, yeah, but I, you have this crucial assumption that the higher. Oh part... yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, yes, of course, yes, yes, yes. Uh, it's it, it. Sorry, it doesn't it doesn't follow from unitarity. It is explained by unitarity here. Is this. It, it is explained from, um, yeah, not even by maybe, uh, it's, no, it, it's, it's, it should be from this, uh, from this low spin dominance, yeah. I, I meant unitarity in the sense we use unitarity to write coupling in terms of dispersion relations. Then uh, we, we use, uh, we, we, we combine this, we use, we derive this rigorous bounds, uh, you know, why is it? We derive this rigorous bound here uh, using unitarity because you know we dropped infinitely many terms just because they're non-negative. So you use unitarity, and then when you combine this with uh, with this rigorous bounds, you get this small small regions. So that's why I think in non-unitary theory, at least I, I don't know what's uh, it's 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 less it's harder to justify. But I agree this there is this crucial assumption for this. Yeah. Okay. So uh, I had Sorry, another. Yes, yes. Can I ask a question about the, the, the inequality above? It's just something stupid. So you, 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 you dropped infinity many terms. Do you get a bound on this? I mean, this interval cannot shrink to zero, but if you had more negative terms on the right, it would shrink the, the right side. And so you have something greater than something and less than something else. And then you're saying, but actually there's, there's a, this something else is a bit smaller because I, have, I need to subtract infinity many partial waves. So can yeah. you get a bound on, on how big can the can this infinity many partial waves be in terms of the low 
partial well, waves you had not, there? Not that, that if you don't want to make any assumption like this, then the optimal bounds, or what we believe optimal bounds I showed you, was this, is this was this game. So here I used unitarity crossing. Now, if you use this extra constraint, it's a little bit, you can try to play the game uh, and uh, you maybe you should be able to improve these bounds. Uh, here, I, I only, uh, I think this, well, at least given this, this simple constraint, again, this, this is the best you can do, but in principle, you know, if you want to do an extra assumption, then you can try to improve these bounds. That's, uh, that would be my answer. So. Okay, but so because uh, for instance, I mean, to the right of the bound, like to get the six, you, you're saying, okay, I, I, take, uh, I take not just the, the partial way of spin two, very small, this is what appears here, but since, since these bounds coincide with the optimal bound, then all the others are also zero. Essentially, yeah. But, um, but again, since there are infinitely many, uh, you have to be, so something like this is not enough. It was crucial that not only no, if you have infinitely many terms, this is not enough because you have sum over infinity. So it was yeah. crucial here to get rid of this infinity. Okay, thanks. But um, yeah. Yes, so uh, one comment I, 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 I wanted to make is about the bounding three point couplings, but since I'm over time, I'm, I'm not uh, saying anything about that. And another one is about bounding in elastic processes, which you can also do by constructing. Uh, I mean, you, you can. I mean, I don't know. We can take a couple of minutes to say quickly, maybe. Okay, so I will. If you give me two minutes, I can do it quickly. Yeah. yeah. So, so okay. Before we talked about this irrelevant coupling, and so you can ask, okay, what about three-point amplitudes? There was this argument uh, by causality to bound the three-point coupling, and now uh, we would like to make it rigorous. So. Uh, one observation is that if you if you take this dispersive sum rule, uh, which uh, which again, it's 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 a legitimate sum rule even in the you know one loop amplitude. It doesn't. There's no problem with that. You see that the sum rule you get is that uh, beta r cube, uh, beta r to the fourth minus beta r cube square absolute value, which is this three point amplitude, is something non-negative. So you like immediately get this bound that the beta r cube is bounded by eight beta r to the fourth. You can check that as usual, the gr, uh, just pure gr does not contribute to the sum rule. So you should not worry. You, can, you don't need to worry about one over t pole. And so you immediately get this bound that the three point coupling is bounded by this uh, beta r to the four, which was considered on this uh, papers. And uh, this just shows that the three point coupling um, um, on the same par as all the other couplings uh, in gravity. Now, uh, of course, say to, to, to connect this to this paper, you want to bound beta r to the fourth in terms of G Newton on a gap. And um, again, this was done in the paper by Simone Dallin and Leonardo and David uh, for D larger than five, if the amplitude is, um, if the amplitude is, makes sense at quantum level and you assume quantum regia, um, uh, and uh, well, you guys assume this supersymmetry, but for gravitons, you don't have to, you have the sum rules and the sum rules becomes like this. So it seems like this, this, uh, your arg this argument discussed in this paper just works for gravity in D larger than five. And so by combining, uh, well, doing this and uh, combining this bound, we will get a precise version of this in D larger equals than five. And equal four, uh, things do not, different things. So uh, this argument does not quite work, but in D larger than five, it seems like we, we should be able to uh, get this bound, at least uh, te technologically. It's- Sasha, like I'm confused because I thought this was just a three level effect. So why, why are you worried about D equals four? Uh, well, so, okay, this is fine. This is, this is fine in D equal four. Uh, what is, what is a problem? If you want to bound B beta R to the four in terms of G Newton and the gap. For this, you need the full quantum amplitude. As far as I know. Yes, because you, 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 you use your paper. I mean, I guess it depends how you write the amplitude, but it was. I think this was the bound that I was complaining that it's not really a bound, right? Yeah. 
No, it's it's a bound in the same spirit. You're bound you're bound in the ratio in uh, in units of the UV cutoff. Right, but if it were violated, you would just say that it's not weakly coupled, right? If the okay. result was twice, what? So it's not really a bound in that sense. It's it's more of a criterion to say are you at weak coupling or not. If your bound is satisfied, you are. But if it's violated, it just tells you are you added to some coupling, right? Uh, you, you mean the, this uh, extra bound by something like uh, G Newton over M gap square? Yes. Yeah. This, I think, makes sense only at weak coupling. Yeah. So this. So it's not a bound, right? It's a criteria. It's not, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I guess here I'm just by default when I'm thinking about this setup, it's a weakly coupled theory. Uh, again, yes. Uh, so in a non perturbative regime. Uh, I mean, it's not a criteria, it's a precise bound in the limit of weak coupling. The fact that you are a weak coupling is, is assumed from the get go. And why, why is G Newton that I, I'm sorry? I thought one over G Newton was in front of the action, and then these betas were inside the Lagrangian. Yeah. And so they should only be suppressed by M gap, no, not G Newton. Wasn't that okay, uh, here you were too, um, you were too care too attentive to what is written on my slides. So in fact, the data is defined here. It's it's naturally has it has to be it has to have G Newton. So you know the way the way the beta, beta is defined here is that um, you you expect this bound uh, to here. If you normalize if you normalize beta if you if you remove G Newton everywhere as you want, then you just get an extra power of M gap. So yeah, that's. If you if you do not if you include but G Newton here you, you get G Newton here, but, but yes to, to make this step uh, then uh, you assume weak coupling and uh, you assume quantum regia, uh, and so this this is really a tr tricky part. So th this part is simple, yeah. but I feel like with uh, with this technology that uh, you guys uh, just here at least. Uh, the summer the summer the summer was there without any super symmetry that's only that's a small comment i wanted to make okay oh, so can, can i ask my question again so if g newton if we're doing perturbative yeah why do we care about this ir divergences we're just doing uh, well uh, okay now how do you if you do tree level how do you um if you do tree level you're saying that uh, you would like to assume, uh, okay, if you want to assume your theory to be tree level theory in 4D, and you would like to assume improved, so not the quantum regime, but improved tree level regime. So um, then that, that you know that in, it, it doesn't grow faster than a square. It grows slowly. Then you have the sum rule, so that's fine. However, uh, to derive the bound from the sum rule, to the best of my understanding, uh, say in this paper, it only works in DLR even fine. Yeah. So you just I mean, yes, technically you have... it's because you need to go to input parameter space and the input parameter representation exactly. is is infra diverged. Yes. Isn't it because what uh, Sasha said uh, in some of his earlier slides in his current setup, he was allowed to put an arbitrary number of scalars in the loop. And of course, if you put if you put an arbitrary number of scalars, then this VR to the fourth is going to scale as the number of scalars. Is this the case? So you'll never get an upper bound. You said, Sasha, that you in, you in this paper you only use the lower bound, but not the upper bound. Yeah. So this is the only place. So yes, you absolutely what you say is right. Now in the model with scalars and the loop, this is the only place in in my talk where there is this red comment assuming quantum region, and uh, to get the sum rule. So to make this extra step, you need this quantum region, and uh, this will not hold in this uh, scalars and the loop model. So. Again, uh, scalars in the loop, you have this, that's fine. But to make this extra step of bounding beta in terms of G Newton and the gap, one needs to assume this improved regia and one needs 
at least currently d larger than five. So even if you are d equal four at three level, this won't help you, at least with the current understanding. Maybe there, is, there are some tricks. So, Thank you. Um, um, and uh, yeah, just a little comment. You can also constrain inelastic processes by building some matrices. So everything essentially is constrained by beta r to the fourth. So let me just finish and uh, okay, thank you. I'm over time, so I'll just leave you with this slide. Thanks so much. There were many questions, but any other questions? Mm, yeah, I have a question. <clears throat> so so I, I, you know, I you, you mentioned yourself that you you would like to also be able to to see what happens if you couple gravity to to strongly coupled matter, yeah. to get strongly coupled matter, uh, and uh, and then another thing which became clear from uh, from what you were doing here, it seems like okay, the string theory is not going to work, but if you just couple it to field theory, you said okay, there is some four point function of stress tensors that is behind all this. But then the only information about this four point function that enters into the amplitude that you consider is just some integrals of spectral densities. All right. So yeah, I just want to make a bit precise what you what you just said because yeah, I'm sure there are some more yeah, yeah sure. You... Yeah, yeah, the gravity is dynamical, so you have you allow to exchange gravitons. So you have three point amplitude, four point amplitude. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then, uh, but then, okay. And so, of course, these four point functions and uh, of the stress tensor, they are they satisfy presumably uh, by themselves. If you impose crossing on them as for field theory four point functions, they satisfy much stronger constraints than just the crossing and the entirety of this. Uh, graviton graviton amplitude that that you consider once you couple them to gravity so it's conceivable in fact that if you were just to focus on if you just express everything in terms of the four point function of field theory and just study crossing for that thing and then even, and then you will learn all you want to, to learn about the spectral densities you will get some much stronger constraints. And then once you plug those constraints into your uh, bounds on the graviton graviton scattering, then maybe you will get something closer to, to your magic island. It's a much harder problem, but it's conceivable that things might work out this way. Yes, yes, uh, uh, yes, absolutely. So that, uh, as you said, uh, we can restate this four point graviton amplitude that we were uh, discuss discussing in terms of some uh, some operation done um, over the two, three, and four point function of stress tensors in uh, in a QFT with some null momenta, say here some of them not null, and then uh, if we understand this four point function well enough, in particular the spectral densities, which is the only thing that matter, uh, and you plug them into the pictures we have, uh, you will get uh, this island. And again, the the just to to say that, let's say you want to go away from this island, then you want to have instead of this. And I, I mean, the natural expectation, if you plot this in large MQCD, you will just you, there is one scale, which is uh, say lambda QCD, and so you will have this you will have these plots again, and you will end up at the same place for these couplings. Um, now, to violate it, you want to have some bump here. Uh, so this bump. Uh, I don't know how physical to generate such bump. Uh, we cannot uh, we cannot simply add a, uh, one 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 magical thing about gravity. You cannot just simply add, in fact, any particle. So if you try to add any particle, isolated particle here of any j and any m, this amplitude uh, violates physiology. So it's not physically consistent. Even but we said that you're supposed to just not think in terms of. So you see, once you say say that it's all about stress tensors. Yeah, yeah, then, yeah. you know, why are we talking about this great and amplitude? It's, it becomes a derived problem while the fundamental problem is to understand constraints of the stress tensors. And stress tensors, I mean, they satisfy a whole zoo of unitarity constraints. You can couple them to gravitons if you want. You can couple yeah. them to anything else. You can probe them in a gazillion different ways. 
And wherever how you problem probe them, you will learn something about that 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 four point function stress standards. And by considering these gravitons, external gravitons, it seems like you're just studying one mm -hmm. constraint out of the infinitely many that the stress standard correlator satisfy. So it's well, good and good to get the best possible constraints this way. I think the the the, the one at least for us one important aspect was that uh, it's. For QFT coupled to gravity, yes, but there are models yeah. which are not QFT coupled to gravity, like string theory. Yeah, I understand. And and, yeah. and surprising thing was that even though they are completely different, they, they have the same structure. So we we can hope that maybe it makes some more general sense than just some lamp post uh, observation. So yeah. Asha. Yes. Hey. Um, so so you identified low spin dominance as a principle that yeah. seems to select the theories we know, but are you conjecturing that it holds in general? And if so, for what value of alpha? Well, that's a dangerous game. Uh, I, I, mean, I I don't know. It's a, I think the precise question uh, maybe we can ask at this point is that like, what is the minimal, like what is the physical theory or physical asymmetrics you can construct which minimizes alpha? I don't know. What is the minimal value of alpha? But I, I suppose the speculation um, that I think you have somewhere in your paper is that this should follow from the full consistency of higher point amplitudes. Well, that's uh, that's uh, th that's my uh, that's a dream, and again, the, that's why I started by saying that the, the physical theory. Uh, well, you know, what is special? We can start writing functions at the level of two to two. The special thing about these guys is that they generate truly consistent as matrices, and so. Uh, I guess if we believe that uh, that there are no other fundamental principles as but just consistency of the whole S matrix, then if this principle gonna survive, then it, it should follow from uh, this larger set of constraints. And uh, of course we can imagine um, uh, probing these bumps in some way. Let's say you have, you, you have, you want to have a theory with such a bump. This looks essentially like a high spin resonance. So let me consider three to three scattering of gravitons where I tune two gravitons to form this resonance and I scatter it off some other third graviton. So I have now this construction where I have a scattering of this large spin, large spin resonance against this graviton. Now, can we learn something from, uh, from, from this? Is it, is, it, uh, is it impossible to make such such thing consistent if you have such spectral density at the level of graviton graviton. Okay, well, we, have the, we will have this di diagram which will violate causality and something else should come out to fix it. Now that's, I don't know, but uh, that, would be the, that would be my guess. If, if, we, if we want to derive something like this, it should, it should come from either, if we're talking about QFT coupled to gravity doing the bootstrap for stress tensors or if we're just talking about as matrices, we have high point as matrices, which can probe, uh, probe more things. So that's, um, um, yeah. Any further questions? Yeah. C can you say again why you stopped at spin two for, for generating your data? Oh, uh, is that just because uh, if you add uh, any other, uh, in any other higher spin guy, then we don't know how to have a consistent theory at three level even, right? If you take- but That's also true, it's spin two, isn't it? Well, at spin two, you can have uh, extra dimensions, for example, you can have infinitely many spin two coming from some Kaluzic line and so it's fine. I see, I, I don't but it's, know already, to... it's already violating the quantum, it's already violating the quantum bound, chaos bound. But, but this is a, I mean, we are talking about the, like leading order correction, right? So yeah. we don't care about quantum range of bounds. So. I mean, if you, if you know, if you, well, in fact, it's not clear if it violates quantum range of bound because uh, I mean, you, you can uh, start, uh, I mean, these things iconalize and then- uh, No, I agree, it's small, play. no, sure. Um, but if you included just, one, say if you included a box diagram with a spin four particle. Yeah. I mean, is that, what does that violate? 
Yeah, this, uh, well, it, it, here it will, it will violate uh, this bound, but you say, okay, I don't care about this bound, that's fine. But now uh, you're saying you have a theory with spin four. Let me take the spin four as a, to the outside, which goes again along this idea that we want to consider consistent as matrices, not just consistent amplitudes. And then if you can try to take the theory as scatter spin four, it, we will get a violation of that, on, of causality, right? Okay. Yeah. So if you watch, you, if you want to do this, you should include, uh, so secretly when, uh, secretly when we are uh, uh, limiting ourselves to spin two, we are considering bootstrap for an extended set of amplitudes where we allow our particles to be external particles. Any other questions? Can I, can I ask how, how this, I, I'm not sure I followed completely the discussion, but how does this fit with uh, Slava's observation? I mean, this, if you were to add a large spin particle, this would, uh, kill the low spin dominance because you can just add it and it's yeah. it's, it's there i guess and then uh, but but it's not it's not a statement about four pin function of stress tensor you would see a problem only coupling with this other external particle yes. so it looks like this is at odd with the expectation by slava then four point of the, the that the four point function of stress tensor already includes enough constraint to get to you, you to low spin dominance is this, is this correct if you if you if I take a quantum field theory with just a free particle of spin j, um, it's a free theory. Probably it's 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 fine. Uh, it's a free massive particle of spin j. There is no problem with that. Now, if you couple it to gravity, when that's when it becomes problematic. So yes, we, we I mean we cannot couple any we cannot couple any QFT to gravity. So, uh, but I thought that one 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 way you can try is that. Uh, we can take say large NQCD, study the bootstrap for stress tensor in large NQCD, and if you understand it, then coupling to gravity uh, is, is is done here will allow you to translate what we've learned uh, about the QFT um, to the bounds on the gravitons. But I think what you are emphasizing is that not every QFT can be coupled to gravity. Yes, I agree. So there's going to be no stress tensor for that uh, for that guy for the that's, that's right. guy. That's right. And I guess the, the the claim would be that if you take some UV complete QFT which has a stress tensor, then yeah, yeah, yeah. it won't have some out of the blue higher spin resonance without at the same time lower spin resonances. I see. Thanks. That's right. Yeah, that's why when you would need when you would couple this guy to gravity, you would need some kind of non-minimal coupling. And, and you can you can compute it for QCD. You say, well, QCD of course has spines, uh, which you don't want, but uh, but you can take some latest QCD data about resonances, and you probably maybe could compute. Everyone can yeah, <laughs> you can learn something. Yeah, yeah it's complicated. Okay, if there are no other questions, we can thank Sasha and thank you. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. And bye bye. Bye bye. Bye. bye.